This is the Osborne One, world's first portable, or better, luggable computer, dating from April 1981. It hit the shelves even four months before the release of the original IBM PC 5150. Well, sometimes you ought to be lucky. I was mentioning this basement clearance in one of my earlier videos, where I could also have grabbed an Osborne One, but it was over my restrained family budget, so I had to let it go in favor to the IBM PC XT. Then the unexpected luck came in just two days after, where I was donated this other Osborne one instead. Now the noble donor said he needs some repair. The question is, will I be able to revive this relic from the past? This is September, the month to honor CPM, the ancestor to DOS. I'm the vintage collector and these are my stories. The week before I had made the video about the K-Pro 2. There's a twist between the Osborne 1 and the K-Pro 2 in that the K-Pro 2 was widely seen as the response to the Osborne 1. The K-Pro 2 was released in July 1982, so 15 months after the Osborne 1. Not only did it feature the larger 9-inch CRT display, but also a native 80x24 columns mode, as opposed to the Osborne smaller 5-inch CRT with its 52x24 columns display. Plus, it did feature the 180 kilobytes double density drives, whereas the Osborne came with the single density drives, which essentially allowed to store only around 100 kilobytes of data. Also, both companies followed a similar strategy for building affordable, not to say cheap, machines and bundling them with a huge software collection. The main goal was to get started into office productivity right away without the need to buy anything from the get-go. Given the initial price tag of 1795 US dollars for the Osborne 1 and 1595 dollars for the K-Pro 2 and the fact that both bundled then popular applications like WordStar, SuperCalc, Microsoft Basic, DBase 2 along with the CPM operating system gave both manufacturers a huge advantage over their competitors. Think about the IBM PC 5150, which launched only a few months after the Osborne 1. While its initial price tag of $1595 may look competitive at first, this was for the basic configuration only, that supported 16 kilobytes of RAM alongside the 8088 CPU, plus it didn't come with any floppy drives or software. You had to shell out at least 40 US dollars for the IBM DOS or 240 dollars for CPM86 plus the additional cost for at least one floppy drive. But you would still need to buy application software such as WordStar for which MicroPro asked 495 US dollars back then. The Osborne one on the other hand came with 64 kilobytes of RAM and two floppy drives already, plus a heap of bundled software including CPM. Even though it was late to surpass by the K-Pro, the Osborne one is an important milestone in computing history, as it was in fact the first commercially successful portable machine at very competitive pricing for the time. Having one of these precious machines now sitting here on my workbench is a very special feeling and I'm coming back to my initial question whether I can fix it. As I was told in the first place that it needs fixing and the caps have blown, I will neither connect it to the mains power nor turn it on as I don't want to make things worse. So I start by removing the front bezel. Here I realize already that the front side rotary pots are broken off. They still hold the rotary knobs well enough, though I may need to find replacements eventually. Also, one of the retainer clips which affixate the keyboard is barely holding together. I need to check out as well where I can find the spare part. Furtherly, I realize this additional plastic cover which sits on top of the 5 inch CRT. I had checked many online photos of other Osborns, but I never had the impression that there were an additional plastic shield on top. I will visit this topic later on again. 
I'm also double checking that the power supply is in fact a switching one which can deal with both 120 and 220 voltage. I'm happy to see that this is in fact the case here as I would permanently damage this machine if it were a 120 volts power supply only. Then I continue removing the bottom side cover which gives me access to the inerts of this machine. Removing the mainboard proves no bigger challenge, there's only three connectors to remove. Pay attention to the color coding, it's best to take photos here. I read beforehand that the cables are not always keyed, so if plugged in reverse during the reassembly you may permanently damage the Osborne 1. Now I can remove the power supply. Upon removing it, I can immediately spot the blacked area on the aluminum grid. Also, a closer inspection reveals in fact blown capacitors. Actually, it's the rifle capacitors, which are used for filtering out any interference. To play safe, I had organized yet another recap kit from console 5, so I'm about to just replace all capacitors on the power supply, even though the electrolytic caps don't show signs of leakage of any sorts. Again, I'm outlining all caps against the parts list to see if I have in fact the correct ones. Also, I'm adding the description to each individual cap, so it's easier for me to process through without needing to do lookups in between. Removing the old caps is no big deal. Again, you should take some pictures to document the correct polarity. In my case, it turned out that, again, the polarity is silk screened onto the PCB. But you can't rely that this is always the case, so better take some pictures up front before desoldering. I'm also cleaning out the areas from any debris where the capacitors have blown. And here's some close up from the blown caps. As mentioned before, there's also some debris on the aluminum grip, so I'm gonna clean that as well. And then I can eventually put everything back together again. I realized though that this machine has been opened before since the ground wires of the floppy drives were disconnected. Ground wires are a safety measure, so I'm reconnecting them again before I put the cover on. However, I will not fully assemble the machine yet, as my gut feeling says there's still something waiting for me. Now comes the moment of truth. Will it turn on? Yes, yes it does! Oh my, how beautiful this is! The system asks me to insert a bootable flop into drive A. I imagine A is left and B is right, so let's see if this theory is correct. I happen to have an original Osborne CPM disc, so my heart rate is really going up now. Will it boot? <laughs> it's unbelievable, this 40 years old machine is still booting off that ancient floppy disc. This is just awesome, look at this! Hold it, hold it, have you tried the second floppy drive yet? You're absolutely right, let's see if that one works as well. Ok, it seems to be able to read the index, but when trying to copy files over I get BDOS errors about bad sectors. You see, I told ya! Oh my, yet another broken floppy drive, not again! And now for those clips, which I later found during my investigation, that these are officially called draw latches. As a non-native English speaker, I'm always struggling with finding the correct terms in order to organize the matching spare parts. At least, the company Southco still exists today and makes these latches. On their website, they provide stock information for various resellers, but you can also find the matching parts on eBay. I just bought four, so I'm having enough spares to fully replace not only the latches on the Osborne 1, but also eventually the ones on the K-Pro 2. Unfortunately, these spares won't arrive in time enough before concluding this video. So what I'm about to do here is to remove one of the latches from the K-Pro 2. 
The Capro 2 has mounted them using screws, so once the replacements arrive I don't need to fully disassemble everything once again to just mount the latches. With this latch now being removed, I want to transplant it over to the Osborne one, though I need to deal with those rivets first. I'm using a drill to remove them, because only then I can attach the replacement latch using screws and nuts. Just be sure to give it some rest every now and then, since the steel rivets could melt the plastic. I'm using a hammer and a punch to motivate the rivets to slide out. Just be extra gentle, as you could easily break the delicate plastic with this brute force approach. Yeah, 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 I will pay attention. Get lost. I'm not fully sure yet if this is gonna last or not, but I'll try using plastic bolts to fixate the latch for the time. As I'm not gonna carry around this machine for extended traveling, this should be good enough. Also, I have to pay attention about the length of these plastic bolts. I have to clip off some of the excess, so I can still slide over the front panel. Now, have you all forgotten about the defective floppy drive? Not at all, I'm turning to it right now. Stop bugging me, okay? So when removing the floppy drive, I soon discovered that I made a thinking mistake here. I was under the impression that these steel shields are mounting cages, so I started disassembling them in order to get access to the inner facing side and the screws holding the floppy drive. Eventually it came to me that this totally doesn't make sense at all, as it definitely was too thin of a material to serve as a mounting cage. Had I read the service manual, I would have known this from the get-go, that actually the drive is mounted to the center side plastic plate. Hence, I must remove the mainboard again to access the correct mounting screws. But then, as I had the drive removed from the base plate, I could also remove the shield. This was still important, as I wanted to see inside. For one, because I want to do some head cleaning. And secondly, I want to see the spindle and stepper in action to better understand what's going on here. So at this current stage, I was then booting up the system again. My intention was then to see if I can read the disk in drive B. The good news is that suddenly I can read some, but not all disks in drive B. And as you can see here, I started to make stacks, the green one with the disks that could be read in either drive, and the red ones being the ones unable to read in either drive. So it was now definitely the case that I could read more discs than before, but also this procedure proved to me that several discs have become unusable over time. From here on it became sort of a repetitive activity, as I started to format the floppies, especially the non-original ones. What's notable to mention is the way how to format the discs on CPM. CPM didn't come with a formatting tool by itself. For the most, it was provided by the hardware OEM, so literally every vendor implemented their own thing when it comes to the floppy disk system and the disk format itself. I heard there was way over 400 variations of floppy disk formats in CPM. That's right, 546 to be exact, at least that's the number of different disk formats that the DOS Utility 2.2 disk has built in. This certainly didn't help for data exchange between the machines anyway. Nope, but that's a topic for a different time. So knowing that every supplier literally brought their own formats, every supplier also had to bring their own format utility. In case of the Osborne CPM flavor, the copy utility is the tool of choice, not only to copy disks, but also to format them. You said copy utility? Yeah, you heard right. The copy utility, which in the DOS world is used to copy files, is used here instead for disk copying and formatting. As opposed to the format command in the DOS world, which does just the latter. And to make matters worse, the pip utility, which is the peripheral interchange program, does on CPM what the copy command does on DOS. At least I can say, most of these floppies would format just fine in either drive, so most likely they just lost their magnetization over time. 
and surely the cleaning of the drive heads also helped big time, I'm sure. I received some original floppy disks along with this machine, actually a set of two, of which one was working error free and one which was mostly borked. I hoped for the best when doing so, but I went down to perform disk copies from the known good floppies onto the bad floppies. And here again, using said copy program to perform those disk copies, I eventually ended up creating working copies for the most cases. And after processing many many floppies, formatting and copying things across all drives and into all directions, I stand convinced that the drive B should actually be ok now and all it took was just a tour of head cleaning. So good enough to reassemble everything at this stage. I would then also take some time to clean the case, that means rinsing it to get rid of some dirt. The yellowing of the case is clearly visible here. But so far I have never attempted to do retro brighting on any of my systems, as I believe applying chemicals would put lasting damage to the plastic and potentially making things even worse. So I generally leave it as is, only doing some plastic breakages fixing as indicated. But luckily, this case has no breakages, with the only thing really needed to be replaced being the draw latch. And so here I am, finally transplanting some of the disc labels from the definitely Borg floppies onto the good floppies. This is a delicate thing, at least where the original labels are still somewhat intact. I have to gently deal with a heat gun and hope to not destroy the labels. And for those here, where the previous owner just scribbled on the labels, I reprinted new ones for a clean but yet not fully original look. Still, if you look at those floppies now in their final state, even including the original Osborne sleeves, it just looks gorgeous and is well worth this relatively small effort. During my final functional verification I noticed that the screen is not fully aligned. Oh well, it seems I have to disassemble the whole thing again and deal with the CRT to do at least some realignment. As I'm a lazy guy, I didn't fully disassemble everything but just lifted the CRT up so I could access those trim pots from the backside. These would allow me to adjust the vertical size and the vertical alignment. I'm aware that I'm having also some misalignment in the horizontal sphere. But reading the service manual, which explains in great length about dealing with the cathode tube itself, I'm leaving it definitely off hands, as it is clearly beyond my skill level. Anyway, after reassembling it for the second time over, here we see some slight improvement. Not perfect, and someone who is used to CRT repairs would have definitely fixed this properly. But sometimes you better leave things as is, if you're not experienced enough. And for me, this is definitely the case with CRTs. And this concludes with some two weeks delay due to me falling sick, my restoration of the Osborne 1. As mentioned before, this machine was a big milestone in computing and especially in portable computing history. Granted, what I have shown you here was not the original Osborne 1 from 1981, but actually a later 1982 second revision which has a slightly different case. You can best differentiate those by the draw latches, which are top facing, whereas on the first revision they were sideways facing, very much like as the ones on the K-Pro 2. Too bad I had to let go the other Osborne one from that basement clearance a few weeks ago, as this would have been the definite chance for me to own both a Revision 1 and a Revision 2 model. In the end, this repair was not too much of a trouble. After reading through other people's experience with their Osborne restorations before, I had expected it to be much worse. But here it is, with a fixed latch, a fixed power supply, 
cleaned drive heads on the floppy drive and a bit of a CRT adjustment, I shall really not complain. I could have replaced the floppy drive with another GoTek floppy drive emulator, very much like as in seeing here with the K-Pro2, but I'm happy to keep my Osborne as close as possible to the original state. What's absolutely awesome is to have these original disc sets along with the machine. It would be very nice to now also have an instruction manual, but maybe I can spot one eventually on eBay. Luckily, this doesn't yet conclude my September series, as I promise to also dive into the data exchange options between CPM and DOS. Give me a thumbs up if you liked this video. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time. You're about to see some potential upcoming topics for future videos right now. Please let me know in the comments which topics you are particularly interested in. Of course, you can also drop me in some other topics you'd like me to chase down. Listen, why are you always interrupting me? I'm not, I'm just asking questions. Yeah, but you're totally rude and disrupting the flow of my videos. So you're asking me to remain silent then? Yeah, the best is you would, yes. Yeah, but... Ah!